Welcome to Reaction with me, Ian Martin, editor of Reaction. And if you're not a subscriber to Reaction on YouTube, press the uh, subscribe button below and also visit the site and become a member of Reaction where you get my weekly political newsletter and lots else beside. But I'm delighted to say we're joined today by Prince Frederick Solms Baruth, who's the grandson of Prince Frederick Zhu Solms Baruth, who play Baruth, who played a central role in the July the 20th, 1944 plot uh, to kill Hitler, Operation Valkyrie. Many of you who have seen that film and, and read about it will be familiar with him. Now, you've been in, in, engaged, Frederick, in a 33-year-long campaign to have your grandfather recognized for his for his role in, in Valkyrie in, in terms of hiding the plotters at the back of his house. And now this has led to some fairly uh, interesting historic uh, historical discoveries, which we're going to talk about today. But you've also been involved in a uh, in a long running in a series of long running court cases with the with the German uh, government. And I think there's a judgment coming up in December, actually, on December the the ninth, on the subject. Now, as part of this, tell us about the historical discoveries that have been unearthed. You've been working with uh, Nigel West, the spy writer in, in Britain. What's the key discovery that's been arrived at? Well, if I may just introduce um, the reason why we got in touch with Nigel. Um, we have a, a, our case proven 100% um, beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, so actually more than beyond reasonable doubt the, the, the qualification is a hundred percent absolute uh, definitive proof. Uh, so we were very confident. We, we had proven it from both angles, from the angle that the uh, confiscation had already taken place um, by the Nazis, and from the other angle, namely that uh, East German land reform had never taken place regarding my grandfather's properties. So we were very um, uh, confident that uh, we were able to prove the case and that these um, uh, these facts uh, and, and this proof had to be accepted by the courts. But what happened was that the court came up, firstly disregarded all of this, and then came up with the most ridiculous uh, uh, sidestepping excuses, uh, for instance, that uh, my grandfather's arrest the day after the failed attempt might have been a sheer coincidence when in fact he was arrested before virtually anyone else was arrested. All the up there agents who were being hidden by him in the back of his house were only executed much later or, or, or pushed into uh, mm. suicide. Um, <clears throat> and then on top of that, uh, the British intelligence report, which was commissioned by uh, General Smuts in 1947, uh, who was obviously, as you know, the Prime Minister of South Africa and uh, had been chosen to replace Churchill, if anything would have happened to him during the war, um, was belittled by the German courts as some foreign intelligence report which uh, would not be allowed into evidence due to lack of proof. And we had already gotten in touch with the son of Major George Alexander Hansen, who was the direct successor of Canaris. As you know, Canaris was Hitler's uh, intelligence chief, but a double agent for the Allies. And um, so the, the, the son of uh, Major Hansen is called Dr. Carsten Hansen. And he had, uh, he, he was a, a very successful surgeon, but then when he realized uh, exactly what had happened to his father, he became more and more interested in the history and um, really became a biographer of his father. And he told us that his father had been in the back of the house running this crack operation, sabotage operation, um, which uh, was really planning the assass assassination attempt on, on, on the 20th of July. So we thought there had to be more to this than meets the eye. And we got in touch with Nigel, I got in touch with Nigel West and asked him whether he couldn't maybe help us find the original uh, uh, Secret Service file, British Secret Service file on my grandfather, 
on which this report that had been issued to General Smuts was based. And that's yeah. how the whole thing came about, because we already had a, a line of communication uh, between the famous two famous double agents, uh, Dusan Popov, uh, codenamed Tricycle, uh, and uh, Johnny Jepson, who was called Artist, codenamed Artist, and the British Intelligence Service and the German Abwehr, which was the German Intelligence mm. Service. Uh, and the link to the back of my grandfather's house with this crack unit sitting there. And when we told Nigel, he said, well, well, I can do much better than that. And so he came up with the link uh, between Otto John, uh, who was an SIS agent, and uh, Major Hansen sitting in the back of the house, and that they had a direct line of communication uh, and Nigel established that the back of my grandfather's house had actually become the HQ, the uh, headquarters for the preparation uh, of the 20th July plot, which is a, a, a breathtaking discovery because until now, obviously all historians always uh, asserted that uh, the plot had been uh, organized by a small group of uh, German, aristocrats and, and army officers, disgruntled army officers, um, and the Churchill didn't want to have anything to do with it because he was insisting on unconditional surrender and so on, but that uh, SIS was fully aware of what was going on and briefed, obviously, on the progress of the preparations for the plot, if if not actively supporting the whole thing, yeah. is, is really controversial. So this, this, so this shows that these findings demonstrate that a, a key German uh, plotter was uh, was a British secret intelligence service, MI6, spy, who met regularly with his handlers throughout planning, uh, throughout planning the, the operation. Why is this important, um, do you think? Well, it, it proves that the British, uh, the British intelligence report on my grandfather, which I just mentioned, uh, regarding the confiscation of his property uh, as retribution for his involvement, direct involvement in, in the plot. And he, he wasn't only housing the, the unit that was planning the whole thing in the back of his house, uh, wittingly, I might add, uh, but he was also meeting with the key conspirators of the plot, uh, most importantly, General uh, Ludwig von Beck, who was the organizer of the assassination plot, uh, still met with him the day before, uh, as well as uh, so many, uh, for instance, uh, Field Marshal von Witzleben, and uh, I, I could go down a list and take up all your mm. time, but at least 10 others. Uh, the key conspirators, Count von Hardenberg, uh, Count Lina, uh, uh, Fabian von Schrabendorf, who was his uh, private uh, lawyer, for instance, uh, one of the three organizers uh, of the resistance. Um, and they would ride out in, into the woods on horseback in order to camouflage these meetings as, as uh, innocuous family outings by, by equestrians. Yeah. It was an ideal cover because the uh, HQ of the Wehrmacht of the army was only 15 kilometers away. So uh, this really confirms that this the, the, the British uh, intelligence report commissioned by General Smuts confirming the confiscation con uh, as retribution for the uh, involvement in the plot um, was correct. And interestingly, uh, the British had also established that it already as early as 1943, uh, the Nazis had um, put a Nazi administrator in charge of my grandfather's Silesian properties, which were another 20,000 hectares. Um, just after he had been accused of sabotaging the war effort uh, and was banished to remain only on his Brandenburg estates. <clears throat> so uh, this is exactly what, what we needed in addition to the proof that we already have, not that we needed it, but simply out of, out of interest. And it just shows up the ridiculousness of the argument of the defendant, uh, namely the state, 
which was supported by the judges, I might say, that um, this was a, a, some foreign intelligence report which had no significance. So this changes. So we'll, we'll talk about your your grandfather in a in a moment. Sure. But so this this but this changes. You think our understanding of uh, the, the the planning of Operation um, Valkyrie and the German resistance. I think so, absolutely, because as I said, until now it was generally accepted that the, the plotters were entirely German and the whole thing was organized exclusively by the so-called German resistance without any assistance by the Allies. In fact, that the Allies viewed these attempts rather skeptically and thought it, even to the point that they thought it might be a trick. And for instance, my grandfather's private lawyer was sent over several times to meet with Churchill at his private estate in, in Chartwell. And they had very intense discussions. And later on, when Shabunov actually survived uh, his incarceration and, and the death march, and when he was interrogated by British intelligence and was asked, well, what was the agreement that you achieved with Churchill uh, in the case of, of a successful coup, Schlabendorf told his interrogators he had given his word to Churchill as a gentleman that he would never divulge this. And of course, that can be viewed quite differently now after Nigel's uh, discovery, because we don't know now to what extent the British were actually actively involved in the planning of the uh, attempt, uh, the assassination attempt. And they would have they would have wanted to have kept this secret for so long for 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 what reason? But is that because the the Allied contention was always that they didn't engage in plots to assassinate um, assassinate uh, uh, leader uh, leaders of of the countries they were at war with? I'm not the right person to ask. Obviously, um, I'm I'm not an intelligence expert, expert or, or, or a military expert. But I can only assume that all intelligence services will never divulge their sources um, unless it's absolutely required by law and that uh, these kind of files remain classified for usually 50 years and then they, they get, it gets extended for another 50 years or, or so on in order to protect yeah. uh, sources and information. Understood. Um, so and it, it, sorry, if I may, it, it, I think the, 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 to answer your question correctly, it really shows that there's still a lot undiscovered as far as the intelligence services uh, are concerned and files are getting opened. Uh, for instance, when, when HLR Hart minuted in uh, Otto John's file that he was an SIS uh, asset, he did that at a time when he had no uh, expectation of the file ever being declassified. Uh, so I think as time goes on, we will know more and more. Mm. Of course, it would be marvelous if, if uh, MI6 were to declassify the file on Otto John, because then historians would really know the extent of, of British involvement, if it was an active involvement, if they actually supplied uh, the, the bomb uh, or the bombs, the, the explosives and the, um, the fuses which were ordered by General Hansen, uh, Major Hansen, sorry, um, out of the back of my grandfather's house that was pro procured for him by uh, several other um, conspirators, mm. but they were British explosives and British fuses. And of course, now that leaves a question open, how did the Germans actually obtain this? Did yeah. they, did they, you know, so far it was always ex assumed that, that they were obtained through a raid somewhere um, uh, and, uh, and raiding a depot or so to make it seem if the attempt would fail that uh, it was the, uh, the, the the planning of the British. Uh, that yeah. was the idea behind it. But of course, now we don't really know. Yeah. So tell, tell us a bit about your grandfather, uh, his situation before and during the war, how he came to be involved. Uh, and then what happened to him afterwards? And, uh, and then we'll, we'll get to your, your, your court case. Of course, well, my grandfather uh, served in the Imperial Army 
uh, during the First World War. His father had been the Lord Grand Chamberlain um, under the last emperor. Um, and um, he had actually become a, a complete pa a pacifist. Uh, my great grandfather as well, he'd been the, in charge of the Red Cross inspection in, in the field and saw all the horrors of all the injured uh, soldiers on both sides and um, uh, passed that on to my grandfather. My grandfather um, uh, stepped out of the uh, armed services, uh, been in the Emperor's um, lifeguard initially and, and um, then moved to another um, regiment in order to fight because the lifeguards um, couldn't take part in active battle. Um, but mainly because he did not want to swear the oath of allegiance to Hitler. This was very important to him. He opposed Hitler even long before he came to power and called him a, a cretin and a misfit and that he'd run Germany into the ground um, and refused to employ anyone on his uh, properties uh, who was a, a member of the Nazi party. And he refused to give the Nazi salute, refused to allow any of the um, staff to give the Nazi salute. Um, so this was quite controversial and he was being watched very closely by the SS and uh, even in, in, the, in the propaganda press, he was, he was over two meters tall. So he was, um, he was called the double story dog and that he wasn't showing enough joy on the event of Hitler's birthday and that he was trying to form a state within the state and all these kind of slogans. Um, and uh, then he resisted confiscation efforts from the Germans for military purposes. Uh, and also uh, the uh, Nazis wanted to deforest vast sections of, of was mainly forested areas. And also they um, demanded uh, a, a huge uh, delivery of resin for military purposes, which my grandfather refused. Mm. And what he did was he decided to simply litigate against them and drag the whole thing out for years, because even under the Nazi time, uh, they still um, took legal matters seriously, well, up, up to a point, obviously. And um, when it came to this point, he was accused of sabotaging the war effort and this Nazi administrator was put in place in Silesia and he was banished to, to his Brandenburg states. Yeah. And it, he had um, started very early on uh, talking to Admiral Canaris, who was his great friend, who he met in, in his club in Berlin because Canaris couldn't be seen coming out to, to Barut, um, and asked him, how he could join the resistance circle and if Canaris could please uh, advise a lawyer who was completely trustworthy because he felt otherwise any other lawyer would immediately rat on him to the, the Nazis. So uh, Canaris uh, advised uh, Fabian von Schlabendorf, who was one of the three founders of the resistance, was uh, Enning von Tesco and Gerdler and Schlabendorf. They started the whole thing. And this was already in the 1930s. Uh, and um, so Fabian became the, the trusted family lawyer. And my grandfather decided to uh, get in touch with General von Beck, who uh, was a great friend of his from the First World War, and who was the leader of the, um, the, 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 the plan to assassinate uh, Hitler and who would have become the leader of the new government. And von Beck found uh, that my grandfather was a great asset, uh, not only because his house was the ideal cover for, for these kind of clandestine meetings, but also because um, of my great grandfather having been the, the Lord Grand Chamberlain, my grandfather still um, uh, was responsible for all the family matters of the Prussian royal family. And von Beck and my grandfather had decided that the post-coup government should have a constitutional monarchy based on the British model with mm -hmm. parliamentary democracy. So this was not a bunch of monarchists trying to reinstitute the monarchy uh, as it had been under the Kaiser, under the emperor, but um, a very liberal democracy with simply a figurehead constitutional monarchy, monarchy like you have in, in Britain. And um, my grandfather, uh, being uh, responsible for the uh, 
family matters of the Russian royal family, uh, had decided together with Beck that it should not be the crown prince, but his second eldest son, Prince Louis Ferdinand. Prince Louis Ferdinand had been a very international uh, businessman. He had uh, worked at the Ford Motor Company in, in uh, the United States, um, and uh, he'd become a great friend of Roosevelt and stayed with Roosevelt on many occasions. And um, he had then um, received a, a job as an executive with Lufthansa. And this is really crucial because uh, this way, he, uh, Otto John, became the direct go-between between, between my grandfather and, and, and the resistance group von Beck and Prince Louis Ferdinand and prepared him for his role as constitutional monarch in case of a success. Yeah. And because Otto John was also a Lufthansa agent, they were able to meet that way in various countries because Otto John, uh, through his Lufthansa position, could yeah. fly all over the place. So, so, th so the, the plot fails. Uh, yes. catastrophically what then happens to your to your grandfather my grandfather was um in his uh study uh, the morning after frantically as soon as the um message came over the radio that hitler had survived he ordered the the staff to fire up the um the oven in the middle of summer this was the 21st of july um and he was frantically in the process of burning incriminating documents when the Gestapo stormed into his study, six of them. Uh, uh, one of them came in from the front um, and showed him a, a document and said, this is a very important document which we need to show you. Uh, and my grandfather really suspected something was going on and reached into his pocket to pull out his Luger pistol to shoot at them. Uh, at that moment, the others came from behind and pulled his jacket over his head so he couldn't move his arms out of, of his pocket and threw him on the floor, kneeled on him, handcuffed him, did the usual thing. And my grandfather still uh, uh, shouted at them and told them, that, that you're lucky uh, I, I wasn't able to shoot you because uh, of my old age, I, I should have been faster, which of course didn't help him very much. And that was held against him uh, as, as dramatic proof of his uh, right. involvement and so on. And he was um, sent to the most notorious prison of Gestapo prison of all, the Prince Albrecht Strasse prison, which now is called the, the House of Horrors. It's a museum for tourists. Um, and held there, tortured, interrogated, all the usual methods, thumb screws, and every, everyone knows what went on there um, for over nine months until he was finally um, made a proposition, you sign over your properties into the full control of Heinrich Himmler, indirectly via a manager who was subjugated in writing to Himmler in exchange for your life. So virtually with, with a noose around his neck. And I think my grandfather would have gladly given up his life for, for his, um, family property because there's so much history was attached to it over 500 years and, and the whole connection to the community and, and the land and so on. But he knew very well that um, it would have meant uh, the destruction of his entire family in retribution. So there was no choice. Um, and he signed this declaration, which today the courts are saying, well, it was notarized. He signed it. He signed over his estates in a notarized form, and therefore it, it's legal because that was a legal transaction then, and it should be a legal transaction today. Which so that, that that that's the German uh, state now saying that after he's been yes. tortured by the by the Nazis, he's then he then signs with a lawyer um, present effectively, and that that makes it legal. Therefore, you have you have no claim. Yes, well, of course, it's it's complete nonsense because um, it's pure coercion. If, if if there's ever a, a prime example of coercion, then this would be it with a noose around your neck and a, a, a clear written uh, condition that if he doesn't sign, he would not be released. And if he would not be released, he would have to go in front of the people's court 
and everyone knew what the People's Court meant. That was the notorious uh, Judge Roland Freisler, who uh, conducted a complete sham trial and condemned everyone to death. Uh, and his, his usual phrase was, you're condemned to death and your property is forfeited to the state. And this is exactly what Himmler wanted to avoid because if that had been the case, the property, which was vast, it was 20,000 hectares in Brandenburg and another 20,000 in Silesia, would have fallen into the hands of the, um, uh, the state finance minister. And Himmler would have lost control of the property. Yeah. And there was actually a, a race, the, the historians term it, um, as a financial race between the uh, finance minister and Heinrich Himmler because Himmler wanted to establish himself as the number one man in the country and take over from Hitler eventually. Uh, and for that, he realized that he needed uh, financial independence. So he had actually set up a private, a secret trust run, uh, run by him by the notorious Oswald Pohl, um, but over which Himmler had full control and into which all the confiscations by the Gestapo of Jewish families, artworks, and you know, enemies of the state, which we were termed as, um, were funneled into. And um, so this is the reason, because uh, I'm anticipating your question, well, why did your grandfather even survive? This is the reason. If they had put him in front of the people's court, he would have been hanged along with all the others, and 40,000 hectares uh, of prime forestry land would have fallen into the control of the state finance minister instead of him. But so, so he survives in dramatic circumstances. Right. And then afterwards, after, after the war, what happens? Well, uh, he was given a one way ticket by the Gestapo um, uh, on, on the day that he was released from prison, which was only valid for 24 hours to go into the American zone of Germany, which he did. And then uh, that, of course, was shifted because um, the, that part was then given to, to the Russian zone. And when the Russians came in, uh, my grandfather father had already sent the family ahead to his brother-in-law, the Duke of Leslie Holstein, which was in the um, British zone. Um, and he remained behind because he felt that he could convince the Russians that because he had been such a staunch anti-Nazi that they would still allow him to keep some of his property. But then he heard that the Russian general had summoned him to a, a Russian general in charge had already summoned him to a town hall meeting. And someone at that town hall gave him the tip that, that he was going to be arrested. So he managed to escape through a bathroom window um, in his, you know, his whole, it was over two meters tall and the bathroom window was very, very tiny. And he managed to get out of there somehow and um, then fled over, over fields and through the woods and so on, all the way from um, Saxony to uh, Schleswig-Holstein up in the north of Germany in his completely emaciated state after having just survived Nazi imprisonment for nine months. So that was quite, quite dramatic. Yeah. And from there, he then applied um, to General Smuts uh, for immigration uh, to uh, Southwest Africa, which was at the time administered by South Africa, as you know, and was, was an allied territory. And at that, that time, uh, General Smuts, of course, couldn't just let in any German willy nilly. In, uh, into allied territory, he had to make sure that he was uh, at least someone who had uh, not supported the Nazis and, and, and ideally someone who had assisted the allied yeah. governments, which he was able to do through the British intelligence report that I mentioned before. So you, you've been pursuing the German government for, I think, for 33 years. And I, I think you've had a, a partial settlement, but you're, but you're fighting on. Why is this still so important to you? Well, uh, of course, it's 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 vital uh, to us, and and it has two aspects. It's vital to my entire family, but uh, first of all, as I said, we have a, a case that is completely proven 
way beyond reasonable doubt from both aspects. No uh, uh, East German land reform ever took place, number one. Number two, the Nazis already confiscated the property. We have this uh, proven forensically, like in a, in a crime investigation, uh, through an ink analysis test, which uh, proves that the Nazis already gave the instructions pre-May 1945 that the property ought to be confiscated and uh, through uh, a simple action. They had given instructions to destroy all the deeds book entries of my grandfather's property. And they were all cut out of the deeds books with a, a razor blade. So you can imagine what kind of effort and how time consuming it must have been to cut out uh, deeds book pages over 40,000 hectares. Um, so that, that's a clear case. And, and because we have this clear case, of course, we need to have this incontrovertibly proven evidence uh, recognized. And on top of that, it's a, it's a simple human um, urge not to allow a thief to get away with stolen property, especially if it was stolen in, in, in such a devious, uh, devious and, and corrupt uh, way through coercion, but there's a much broader aspect to this, um, and this is the second point. Um, for me, it is really vital to shine a light on these Nazi crimes for future generations, um, and also for other claimants who might be out there who were hoodwinked in, in the same way as we were, for instance, told that, oh, you, you you lost your property under East German land reform, when the state knows very well that that's not the case. Um, but more specifically, I really want to draw attention to the perfidious methods that the Nazis employed to cloak these crimes of theirs in a veneer of legality, because all these crimes were cloaked in, uh, in, in, in what they, made seem to be legal transactions, so complete smoke screens. And anyone who believes this today falls victim to the precise plot of the Nazis to hood, hoodwink and, and, and trick them. And I think there's a great danger for democracy uh, that lurks behind this, because anyone who falls victim to this is an easy target by by any dictatorship. So the, the, there's a judgment uh, in in December. Do you? What it's do you... not a judgment, really. It's um, it's a it's a, a, a verbal hearing. Yeah. So um, this is crucial to us because um, these new pieces of evidence that, that I mentioned, um, uh, for instance, the withholding of case turning file by the defendant by the state, which uh, that it's, it's, uh, it's up to a judge, of course, to decide whether this is a version of, of justice, but it's a, it's a clear case of, um, of perjury, because the representative for the state who withheld the file had um, claimed under oath that he had divulged all files all documents that were in existence and in the possession of the state when they knowingly withheld the case turning file for over 30 years. And then when they were exposed, when we finally found the file, uh, they came up with the flippant excuse that um, they had known of the file, sure, but they had felt that it was irrelevant. So we're currently investigating whether this was simply a case of anticipatory obedience by the representative for the state, or whether there were more sinister motives behind it. For instance, that um, uh, he was following direct orders from above, so to speak. Well, I was, I, I was going to ask you, what does this tell us, do you think, uh, about German politics today? Well, <sighs> It's, that is a tricky question because the German constitution, there's nothing wrong with the German constitution. It's a, it's a near perfect constitution, which was um, 
set up with the help of the Allies, actually, because Germany can be thankful to the Allies for enforcing democracy in 1945. And, um, but the problem is the application of the law. And by that, I mean that it's always humans who apply the law. And unless these humans are completely um, uh, independent of the executive, of the executive, then they can get constricted in a very complex set of dependencies. So, and, and uh, if you have the situation where a state representative in a legal case such as ours, which is a Nazi restitution case, a clear Nazi restitution case, withholds a case turning file that has been sitting in their and this is the ironic part, in their restitution archive. And the courts don't do anything about it because th this file was not just withheld from us, it was withheld from all of the courts through uh, all these years. For instance, if I'd withheld, if I had withheld a file, let alone a case turning file from, from the courts, I would be sitting in jail right now and we wouldn't be speaking to each other. But the courts have no rebuke for the, um, uh, the representative of the state, and they, the, the state comes up with the flippant uh, excuse, oh, well, yes, no, well, we said under oath that we, we, we had divulged all files, put all, all of them on the table, but, um, and we knew of this file, yes, sure, but um, we simply regarded it as irrelevant. Nothing gets done, total silence, when indeed uh, the, the state body, BADV, which is the, the, the federal uh, body for unresolved property matters, should on its own, without taking up even more time of the court, uh, unnecessary time of the court, should on its own actually remedy the situation and, and hand out the properties right away. But there's deathly silence, yeah. no rebuke from the court. And this, of course, needs to be investigated. And we're in the process of doing this right now. But that's... that's that's at odds isn't it with the way in which germany has in a in a pretty courageous way in certain respects and a rigorous way had a conversation about its past and come to some sort of some sort of reckoning indeed and um but there seems to be a general tendency like in the looted art situation where the german public seem to feel that it's morally justified uh, when a property that ought to go to the, the rightful owners is kept in public museums instead of being restituted. And um, of course, this is, this is um, not a moral uh, argument at all because it's completely unjust. It has nothing to do with justice. And it's merely a cold calculation to run the claimants, the rightful owners, out of steam, legally, financially, morally, health-wise even. There are so many Jewish families who are simply giving up because it's affecting their health. And you know, even for myself, I'm, I'm still relatively young, but it, it does take quite a toll on, on, one's, uh, on one's mental health. Understood. Um, and what's, what's the situation with, the, with the, the land specifically now? Well, the land is entirely in, in the hands of the German state in, in the hands of the, the federal state and the local state of Brandenburg. Uh, and I've made it very, very clear right from the beginning in order to not cause any confusion that any private individual who acquired any of this land uh, in good faith, um, I will exclude entirely from the claim. All I want is the German state to return the property that was so uh, uh, nastily uh, stolen from my grandfather with such trickery, uh, because they they are the direct inheritor of the Third Reich, as they they admit themselves, and they have the responsibility to act according to their own laws enshrined enshrined in the constitution and finally do the right thing instead of sidestepping the issue which they've done now for 30 
three years by withholding case turning files and coming up with ridiculous arguments such as I've, I've, I've uh, pointed out yeah. before. And what, what, ha what happens to all of this material? You've worked with Nigel West, who's, um, who's reviewed the uh, role of your grandfather in the, in, in the preparation of the, of the coup, and a lot has been un uncovered, which gives us a new historical insight. Once the court case is done, what, what, are, your, what are your plans then? Well, the plans are, of course, to take the property such as has not been sold yet because they are already behind my back selling property because of the um, a verdict in the federal administrative case, which is uh, considered uh, as uh, in Germany, there's, there's a word called rechtskräftig, which means as enforceable. So where they can, they're already selling bits and pieces of the property so that by the time I'm successful with my claim, uh, if indeed I am, uh, there won't be any joint larger pieces left. Everything will be split up. In, in, in the case they do that and, and I'm successful, they would have to pay a compensation. But that's, of course, not what I'm interested in. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm interested in the actual property in the same shape and form as it was when it was stolen. So the, yeah. Yes, and, and of course, the idea is to uh, uh, maintain it in a sustainable way, uh, environmentally sustainable way, uh, which benefits the entire community, as it had always been the case in, in my grandfather's and great grandfather's time. Prince Frederick uh, Soms Baruth, uh, I well, thank you very much for joining us today to talk us through this. If you're not a subscriber to Reaction on YouTube, click the YouTube uh, subscribe button below. Also visit the site where you can get my weekly uh, newsletter for members of Reaction. Until next time, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much indeed.